and I welcome you. This is the Central Florida Computer Society, the Windows Special Interest Group, or WinSIG, for Sunday, January 10th, 2021. Welcome. Uh, we have a pretty good crowd for today. And let me stop the share for now. And uh, thank you all for joining. I have several items that I think you'll find interesting. Uh, at least I hope you will. And the first one is I did a recording because I'm doing a set of the Windows Tips app. And uh, I'm going to start with that today. And then we'll have some discussion maybe on some of it, if some q and I have a couple other items. And then I want to show you uh, how I used a scanner that I did a, a a presentation on. I'm not going to show that presentation, but I'm going to show you the results of some of the scanning I did by creating some memories, or not creating the memories, but recalling some memories uh, for those of you who've been around computers for some time and kind of introduce some of you who are new to computers, what we had to go through back in, in, in the day, as some people refer to it. So again, I'm going to share my screen and uh, minimize this and start the video. Move this out of the way. Hello, I'm Huey Poplock. I'm going to be talking about Windows Tips. It's an app from Microsoft that's part of Windows 10. The Tips app in Windows 10 is full of short and sweet tips that help you get the most out of Windows 10. Each tip has a button on it so you can try it out with a single click or you can learn more. All you need is a couple of minutes to go through a set of tips and new tips are added every so often. And to get the latest tips, make sure your Windows uh, is connected to the internet. So let's take a look at what I'm talking about. You come down to the search box and type in tips. And it will be up here. You just click on it and it'll open. So let's make it just a little bit larger so we can get more on the screen. And you can check out what the latest tips are. You can explore what's new. But there's a list of several topics many topics. Each one contains more tips and they're called cards. We're going to take a look at what's new today. and We may not even get through all of them. And this will be a continuing ongoing project from me. So let's take a look. So let's explore what's new. By clicking this, we get card one of 12. What's your favorite mode? Make your app and app tiles stand out with light or dark mode. I prefer the light mode, but if you want to change yours to the dark mode, it's very easy to do. One, we can just click on this and it'll take us right to where we want to go or you can go to, let's do it. Let's go to settings, personalization, and colors. And right here, you can choose your color light or dark. If you change it to dark, it will look like this. Let's leave it there for a moment and take a look. And so you'll, so if we open up the menu, it's going to be in dark mode. And so will most of your menus and other items. For instance, let's so let's open up our file explorer. It's in dark mode. Let's go back to the settings. We're going to change it back to light. It changes here. And it also has changed our file manager. Let's go to the next card. 
Keep tabs on your website tabs. When you're on a frequently used website and have a lot of tabs open, pin that site to your taskbar. Then just hover over the pin to see a preview of the open tabs. To pin the website to the taskbar in Microsoft Edge, go to Settings, More, then More Tools, and pin to taskbar. Let's do it. I'm going to, I already have my Microsoft Edge open. I have three tabs. You might, I've had as many as 20 or 30 open at a time. But let's say this particular one I want to have and be able to, to see. What I can do is I go to More Tools and pin to Taskbar. You give it a name. I'll go ahead and just leave the one that was there. And it pins it down here. As I move my, hover my mouse over it, I will see that page. And even if I go to a different page, or a different tab, I should say, which is a different page, I can come down and hover over that one and see if it changed any or something is different. The card leads me to believe that it's going to show all of the tabs. It doesn't do that. And so I probably would never use this, but it is nice to the fact that if I close my edge, since I pinned it to the taskbar, I can click that, it will open up my edge and it will be on the page that I wanted. So if you go to the same website frequently, you can set that up as a link in your taskbar to go to it very quickly. The next item in what's new is quickly jump between open web pages with Alt plus Tab. Select the Alt key and the and tap the tab to toggle through the apps and items you have open, including website tabs in Microsoft Edge. I've shown this uh, in other recordings recently, but let's take a look. I'm going to click Alt-Tab on my keyboard, and as I do, it, 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 when I let go of the keys, it goes away. So I hold the Alt key down, hit the Tab button, and then hit the tab button again and keep hitting it. You'll see the white square box around it changes so I can go to any item in the order that they are on there. And I can so I can have a lot of windows open and easily find what I want and go back to it. The fourth card in the What's New group of tips is have magnifier read text aloud. Magnifier, the screen magnifying feature that comes with Windows 10, can also read text aloud. To use it, you turn on the magnifier and settings by pressing the Windows logo key plus the plus sign. Uh, and then you select read from here and then use your mouse pointer to select where you want it to begin. To do that, let's go ahead. I'm going to minimize this just to make things on the screen look a little bit better because I have two screens to work with. And I hold the Windows key down and the plus key. That will turn on the magnifier menu. Now I'm going to bring over a notepad text document, which is the my introduction to what we're doing with the Tips app. I am going to come here where it says read from here. I am going to click that. I'm going to come over here and HTML content about the tips app Windows 10. The tips app in Windows 10 is full of short and sweet tips that help you get the most out of Windows 10. Well, that's very nice, but I didn't magnify anything. You've got to magnify from here. We'll make that 200. We'll bring this over just a just a hair so we can get everything here i'm going to click from here start here html content about the tips app windows 10 the tips app in windows 10 is full of short and sweet tips that help you get the most out of windows 10. each tip has a button in it so you can try it out with a single click or learn more all you need is and you can see there 
Uh, let me let's see if I can come over here, get this back down to 100%. We'll move this over back over here, and that's all there is to it, really. You can magnify plus and minus uh, as much as you want, bring it up, bring it down, but you can also do the text reading within it. The next card in what's new is keep an editor handy. On the home tab, choose editor. To focus on the issues you care most about, click a correction or refinement type like grammar or clarity. Then use the arrows on the suggestion card to step through each issue. Now this is in Word, but the editor works in several programs and let's uh, take a look. I have an article that I copy and pasted that has some errors in it. I did it in a document from Word and I did it in a Gmail. Let's see how the Microsoft editor handles that. First in Word and we're using the online version of Word and you'll see up here it says editor and you'll see also that there are several underlines and different types of underlines. So let's take a look at the editor and it'll tell us we have an editor score of 59%. There's one spelling error and three gra grammatical errors. And let's take a look at what they might be. So if we move my mouse, mouse over where it says weren't, it says check to view suggestions. So let's go ahead and do that. You might want to change it to were not instead of weren't. Okay, what about the word was? Click there for, it should be were. Opportunities, it's, so you can see that you can, and you can make this changing, changes right here just by clicking. And so on through this document. Now in a Gmail, it works much the same way. I have a new message for Gmail with the same information, the same paragraph, and you'll see there's a was here. If I click it, it says were, so I can change that. And the opportunities is spelled wrong. It spells it right. I do it, change it here, and so on through these. So the editor works in more than just Microsoft products, and it works in more than just a uh, word processor, it'll even work in most emails as well. Card number six in what's new is edit in multiple languages. To check text in another language, select the text and go to review, editor, set proofing language, and then choose your language, and that will be in Word. Editor doesn't check for the same issues in every language. When it's checking for more than one language, editor lets you know which refinements are available for which languages. Since I don't do multiple languages, I can't show you this. Next few cards deal with some templates that are available from Microsoft. Family safety and emergency prep. Quickly create emergency instructions, contact lists, plans, and checklists so you can keep calm and have peace of mind. All you have to do is click this button here, and you will see that there are Word and PowerPoint templates for all kinds of emergency contact lists and things to do in emergencies and maintenance and task lists and so on. The next card is fun activities for you and your kids. Puzzles, coloring books, infographics, and more. Enjoy these free activities with your children, family, or friends. And again, it's a bunch of tem templates in PowerPoint, in Word, Excel. And let's take a look at some of these. There's a Sudoku game, geography, learn to draw coloring books, and so on. Some infographics that you can deal with and play around with within PowerPoint. And several word, paint by numbers. 
all kinds of coloring for the kids. The next card is Family Tree Generator. Browse family history templates. Record your family's past, present, and future with ancestry charts, photo albums, and newsletters. Here's what some of those are. These again are templates for Excel and PowerPoint and Word. You're going to have newsletters, family newsletters, family photo albums, some charts, family tree charts, and so on. Where the templates are already done, all you have to do is put in your own personal information. Browse learning templates, top templates for home learners, multiplication tables, reading log, and so on. As you can see, some are in Word, some are PowerPoint. Beneath the surface, Earth's history, spread of life, PowerPoint. These are all templates that you can use for free uh, from Microsoft that are available for you. The next card is add an emoji from your keyboard. Express yourself however and wherever you want. Press the Windows logo and the period. We'll do that right now. And that will bring up your emojis. And you will see that there are just all kinds of types and you can view them here. So each one of these is a grouping and there's just tons and tons of them available for you. And there's more shortcuts for you. You can click on that and it'll give you some, some more things to look at. Some of you may not use emojis. But now it might be a good chance to take a look at some. Some are fun to use. The final card under what's new is take a snip of what's on your screen. And that's using the snip and sketch. And as an example, what we'll do here is we'll just click here. We click on new. You take your mouse and you just drag it, grab something that you want from the screen. Now I have a program called Snagit that's turned on that it goes to the editor, but normally it just puts it in the clipboard and then you can drop it and paste it into uh, either an email or a Word document uh, or a WordPad document and so on. So those are the cards for what's new. We're going to create some more videos with other templates and other tips that are available. As I said, there are a lot of them. We're going to try to do some more of these videos to show you some of the things that you can do from within Windows, from the Windows Tips application. Thank you for joining. I'm Huey Poplock. Hey there. Are there any questions? Don't forget you're muted. Bob? I use the Windows editor. It's replaced uh, Grammarly for me. I used to use Grammarly when they came out with this, since I already have Office and I'm already paying for it. I might just as well consolidate, and Grammarly's been doing a nice job. I'm sorry, <laughs> the editor has been doing a nice job. Yeah, I've been really pleased with it. You'll also notice if you do have a paid account of Office, uh, editor also has the transcribe as a choice. And you can, I think it's only the online version of it. Uh, and you can upload, and I've been using the transcribe to uh, record a Zoom meeting of a, bo of a board meeting. I record it and then I take the audio and upload it to my Word 
document to transcribe and it turns it all into text. It has speaker one and what they say, speaker two and what they say. And you can take speaker one and say, okay, that's a uh, Huey. And then say, do you want to do it in all the instances? And it'll replace speaker one all the way down in the document to speaker uh, to Huey instead of speaker one. Uh, and I've talked about this on here before. Uh, and then another one was Stan. Let's say Stan is speaker two. And I do that and it picks up everywhere is where Stan speaks. It puts his name in there instead of speaker two. And then I save uh, and then I uh, bring it into my Word document and then tell it to save it. And then I send it as a Word document to the secretary. And she's not only got her notes, <laughs> but she also has a complete transcription of everything that was said. So she can check to see what was said. It really works nicely. It is a little bit time consuming, but it works very, very nicely. I've also used it on the support forum where the question was asked in a foreign language. So it can translate it for me and then I can actually answer it in English and transport it back into that language. So I can actually communicate with someone in a different language that I don't speak. And I've been told that the translation has been very, very good. So there's a lot of ways to use these free services that are part of your Windows without having to go out and, and pay for or to install external programs. It's A lot of these things are built into uh, your Windows and your Office products. Uh, Ken, is your hand up? Okay, no. Okay, anybody else? All right. Well, I hope uh, you got something from that. Uh, let's see. Okay, Lee says she uses the editor in three different languages and it works great. So thanks for that note as well. I'm gonna move the chat over. I can leave it open. I don't have to uh, work on the screen. So let's let's take a look at uh, sharing my screen again. And come on, I don't need that now. And this time what we're going to do is we're going to open up uh, my browser, which I use Chrome most of the time. Full, well, let's see, full screen it. And uh, control, make it everything bigger. And I'm going to go to today's meeting information. By the way, if you are not, and a lot of you are, but if you're not subscribing to the mailing list, please fill this out and so uh, I don't have to send 15 different ways of, of sending everybody information on the meetings. Uh, I only send it out usually once a month. And, and please open the emails. I did send a second one out to anyone who, who uh, a MailChimp uh, saw as not opening their, uh, their, their uh, letter because uh, if you don't, uh, MailChimp knows it, and I sent out a second one to try to remind you to log in. Um, let's see, for today, let's see, it's WinSig, and I've already started for the WinSig notes and for today. Now, I do want to tell you that I have started some preliminary work on a new website. I'm going to redo my website, take a lot of the old stuff off, a lot of things that I don't use, and make it easier to navigate and easier to find things. And I'm hoping that I can also have uh, uh, ways to uh, connect to a lot of my online videos much easier to make it so you don't have to, I don't have to have a page of links and you got to go to them. I'll be able to embed a lot of it in the, uh, in the new website. It's going to take me a few months because I've got to learn the software, uh, how to do some of the things and play with it. And I've already gotten stopped on a couple of things that I've had to go and research to try to figure out how to use. So uh, that, it's going to take a little while. So anyway, we did the first item, tips for Windows, part one. I have uh, completed much of part two, which is another grouping within the Windows apps tips where I'm showing you some things as we go along and I'll have that ready by next month for the meeting. Uh, 
And the next item on here was five Microsoft technologies. By the way, let me make this bigger here so you can see this bigger. I'm just using control plus and it enlarges everything on the screen. So we're going to take uh, the five Microsoft products or technologies to watch in 2021. Some of these I don't know a lot about. Uh, by the way, this is from uh, um, Mary Jo Foley, uh, who has a, a column called uh, All About Microsoft. And she and Paul Therott, who I mentioned quite frequently on this, uh, uh, on this uh, Windows SIG, uh, is the two of them do something called uh, Windows Weekly on Twit or This Week in Technology. And they're, they've been around for many years and are very good at sniffing out what's coming and, 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 and bringing together a lot of information. Mary Jo Foley usually talks more on the enterprise where Paul Therott talks more on the windows and the gaming parts. So uh, one of the things that they were talking about is the meta OS for mobile masses. Uh, Microsoft has an evolving strategy and fundamental layer in the Microsoft 365 cloud space, which is somewhat better known at, internally uh, than in, in externally. And that initiative is known as Meta OS, sometimes known as Taos. Uh, it's meant to be a single mobile platform that provides a constant set of work and play services across devices. It's not an OS the way Windows is an OS or operating system, but it does consist of a number of layers or tiers, including Office Substrata and Microsoft Graph uh, uh, and an application model that includes work, Microsoft, Work Microsoft is doing around the fluid framework. It's fast co-authoring and object embedding tech, power apps and Visual Studio dev tools. So she thinks in 2021, we'll hear more about how Microsoft is looking at apps as a single task product and services. Think uh, planner stream, tasks, lists, files, whiteboard, notes, and so on. Fluid flame framework, say that 10 times quickly, uh, plays a big role here. This strategy and its rollout could have big implications for developers consumers and first line workers. So we're seeing more and more of Microsoft going to the cloud and cross platform their, their services. Uh, universal search information at your finger trips revisited. Microsoft Bill, uh, founder Bill Gates had a vision of enabling users to have information come to them instead of having to seek it out. His Comdex 1990 keynote even was titled information at your fingertips. Decades later, Microsoft is finally getting closer to make this idea a reality via its universal search technology. Uh, and there's some more information on that. Uh, let's see, I'm just looking. So that was the second of the five, this is a universal search. Intelligent Edge, uh, just more than IoT. This is the third item that we need to be watching. The Microsoft was first the major cloud vendors to embrace hybrid, although some officials call out PCs and servers as examples of intelligent edge devices. Microsoft embrace of that definition will likely become more prominent in 2021 and beyond. When many think of edge devices, they immediately think of internet of things or IoT products but Microsoft has been growing its portfolio of what constitutes an edge device over the past couple of years. Ruggedized PCs like Azure Stack Edge Pro and Pro R are edge devices. Any kind of device with an onboard AI processing capabilities qualifies as intelligent edge device. Even the recently announced Azure modular data centers, which are data centers inside shipping containers, which can operate without internet connections intermittently connected and or permanently connected via satellite are also edge devices. So you're seeing a lot of new technology behind the scenes that, that you don't directly uh, 
participate in, but will affect your computing in the coming years. So a lot of exciting things coming. Microsoft has yet to announce its AWS, which is the Amazon uh, uh, a work uh, outpost competitor, which it's codenamed Fiji. Uh, she's expecting this could be a 20, 2021 announcement. Fiji is meant to provide users with the ability to run Azure as a local cloud managed by public Azure and delivered in the form of racks of servers provided by Microsoft directly to users. Obviously, that's not gonna be you and I, but it's going to be big companies. Uh, Fiji also fits into Microsoft Intelligent Edge family. The next item is what we talked about last week, and that's, uh, or last month, I should say, here on uh, uh, the CFCS WinSig, is the cloud PC the desktop virtualization as a flat rate service. Microsoft is expected to announce in the spring of 2021, its cloud PC document as a service offering. Cloud PC, codename uh, Deschutes, is, a, is built on top of existing Windows virtual desktop service. Unlike WVD, cloud PC will be a flat rate subscription service, not a consumption price service. Cloud PC will be an option for customers who want to use their own PCs made by Microsoft and or other PC makers, basically like thin clients with Windows, Office, and potentially other software delivered virtually by Microsoft. It may debut along Windows 10X, providing the first batch of 10X Windows, WinX users a way to run their existing Windows 32 apps, since the first version of 10X won't include Windows 32 container support, resources say. Depending upon how the various cloud PC plans are priced, this service potentially could become a strong member of the Microsoft 365 and commercial cloud stable of services. And that's what we talked about and had a discussion on last month. If you did not see that and you wanna go back and look at the uh, recording of last month's uh, uh, a WinSig meeting. The, the uh, fifth item on here to watch in 2021, and I really haven't checked into this, so I don't have a, a pretty good understanding of it yet, uh, is Windows 10. X. Now, it was mentioned earlier, Windows 10S, 10X is something different. Uh, 10X is another run at Chromebooks complete. Since Chief Device Officer Panos Pane took over uh, more of Windows, the more of a Windows team earlier this year, Microsoft message is Windows is back, baby. In 2021, Pane and team are hoping to prove the company has decided to invest more in the making of Windows great again uh, with a variety of efforts, including the 21H2 Sun Valley UI refresh. I'm gonna talk more about that a little bit. Uh, more work to make Windows 10 on ARM viable and the launch of the Windows 10X, a new Windows 10 variant meant to be simpler, cleaner, and more manageable. Microsoft's original plan for 10X was to debut as the OS for dual screen and formidable Windows devices. The new post-COVID plan calls for Windows 10X to debut on a new single screen PCs, including clamshell laptops and two-in-ones, among other form factors. Microsoft officials publicly deny that 10X is the company's latest attempt to compete with Chromebooks but sources say this is definitely the sweet spot for the 10X devices. Their initial target markets include education and first time workers, the same customer groups on which Microsoft focused with Windows 10 in S mode, which officials also refused to say publicly was a Chromebook compete effort. Microsoft officials have not made 10X available externally to Windows Insiders testers, uh, window, a word is Windows 10X will only 
be available on brand new, not for existing PCs, and could begin shipping on those devices starting this spring. Windows 10X is expected to run on Intel-based PCs at launch, but Microsoft has been testing 10X internally on ARM devices, sources say. So maybe it will be available on new ARM-based devices at some point in the future. So those are the five, five items, according to Mary Jo Foley, for people to keep an eye on. So let's uh, make this so it's not full screen so I can see my tabs. And I'm gonna close this. And the next item is how to easily batch rename. How am I doing on time? Um, I may just go ahead. I'm going to skip that. Uh, I'll just quickly show you that it is an article. Uh, let's make it full screen and make it larger. And it just tells you how, and it shows you in the article how to power rename and rename articles, uh, rename uh, photos and so on very easily from within, uh, within Windows in a batch mode. So if you wanna take a bunch of pictures and rename them all with the same name, but a number after them, so it will look, uh, it'll look like this. Instead of being all of these names, it will be Texas photo one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So uh, it's a good article to take a look at and to follow uh, the instructions to try to use it. I'm not gonna demonstrate it today. I do have a program that I use to rename files and, and so on that, uh, that I use. Uh, how to choose your default microphone and microphone in Windows 10. Uh, how to speed up, uh, that's a video that's part of this. Let me go ahead and use uh, this and full screen it. So we're gonna be in uh, uh, this mode. And uh, so you just see the article. So uh, you can also set the default microphone in some apps. Just go into, to, uh, into the settings, go to system, go to sound, and then choose the microphone from that. You can also use the control panel. And uh, let's kind of take a look at that. Let's, I'm gonna come here. <clears throat> I'm going to go here and then I'm gonna go to system and I'm gonna go to sound. And then you'll see your um, uh, input, your microphone, you'll notice here, I have many items that I can use as my microphone within Windows because I have a lot of microphones and microphone software set up within my uh, computer. You may not have all of those choices. The other place was to come down here. Let's go ahead and close this and we'll minimize this. So you can see if I come down here and you'll see my sound is here. If I right mouse click my little sound, hopefully you can see that, I'll get this and I can then open up sounds here and I get this. I wish I could make this bigger. I don't believe there's a way to do that. I could probably open up the, uh, the um, uh, magnifier, but just to so show you go to recording and there is the same choices. You go to microphone uh, and you'll see that there are many microphones there and you can choose what your default one is by clicking on setting default. So there's a couple of different ways to get there. So let's uh, come back here, close this out. The next item is what is Google One and what do I get with it? I'm going to skip that today as well. I do wanna uh, mention to you that there is a new way to scan I did a video on this. Uh, I'm just going to open it and show it to you. Uh, it's uh, there. Like, just go to the link. You'll see that I, I, I'm showing how to scan, how I use the scanner. Let's see if I can find a picture of it here. This was the scanner itself. I did a whole 
uh, session on using this for Tech for Seniors, please either watch the video of this or watch the Tech for Seniors video and, and see how I did what I'm going to show you next. What I'm going to show you next is I don't need this. Come back here. I do have links to the 1984 bus line, the 1988 bus line, and the 1990 by clicking uh, on that website. But I'm going to actually show you those documents because I want to do that uh, for this session. Let's first take a look at the bus line from 1984 in March. And I'll open it. And then I'm going to make it, uh, well, I've got it right now where you can see the whole page. And uh, you can see over here on the left now, I'm in Acrobat Pro, uh, which is not Acrobat Reader, it's the, the uh, a full version, but Microsoft, uh, or I'm sorry, Acrobat, Acrobat, the Adobe Acrobat uh, Reader will do much the same. I just just do some, some other things with it. This happens to be the default I have. Uh, I'll open the next one in just Acrobat so you can see how you can do what I'm doing. But uh, you can take this page and then you can zoom in on any part of it and, and you can see it. So I'll do that for here. Now this is March of 1984 for bus line for those of you who are not CFCS members uh, is our newsletter, which we haven't published uh, it only goes out as a uh, reminder of meetings and so on. It's not a publication anymore, uh, only because we don't have anyone to do it. Our one volunteer does it through a uh, MailChimp uh, publication. But at this back in 1984, it was all done with desktop publishing. Now, if you remember back in those days, for those of you who were around with computers in those days, when somebody did a, a newsletter, they did it with desktop publishing. There was Aldis, uh, PageMaker, uh, and there were several others, which were very expensive programs. And it only produced the newsletter to be printed and then sent uh, to a printer. Uh, you could not uh, save it as a digital document and share it with others unless they had the expensive program. There wasn't a way to convert it and have it available. There was no Adobe uh, Acrobat at those at that time. So I have a collection of some old bus lines and I scanned them using this new scanner. And that's what I'm sharing with you today. Back in 1984, I was not even a member. I wasn't even living in the Orlando area. 1984, I was a member of the uh, Tampa Bay Osborne Users Group, and then the Tampa Bay PC Group uh, uh, Computer Society, which became the IBM PC Users Group, and then the uh, Tampa Bay Computer Society, and now it's the Tampa Bay, they have a different name to it now, uh, uh, Training Center, I believe they call it. Technology anyway, Center. Thank you. And that's a, one of the members of that group. Uh, this is the bus line from back then. Bill Wellman was president. Some of you know or knew some of these people. A lot of them aren't, aren't with us anymore, but you'll see. But the thing about this particular issue that I want to show you is back here is they had a page of history of 10 years earlier. CFCS was one year old. You can see as of this month, we're one year old. So that was December 1977. So CFCS was started in December uh, of 1967. We've been around a long time. And uh, uh, they were meeting and this, they didn't, there wasn't a lot of information in their newsletter back then, but mostly about the meetings and to bring, to bring things to the meeting to discuss. But uh, it's just nice seeing that there was even a newsletter back in 77, but this is, and you can see through this article, uh, here's an, an ad for a Zenith 1000. Uh, I just want to just, and at that time we were using dot matrix printers and you had to have a ribbon and those ribbons, you could buy them uh, from this particular company and they were, that was pretty cheap. Uh, but if you had a daisy wheel printer, uh, you could get the wheels uh, 
the the ribbons for the daisy wheel printer the wheels were expensive but the but you could buy the ribbons and you had to replace the ribbons and at that time the security wasn't very strong because if you looked at a ribbon you could see where each letter was punched out on the ribbon and you could actually read what somebody typed so uh, there was uh, uh not a lot of security back in those days so uh, there's not a lot in this newsletter that uh, to show, uh, let's see, they were talking about the meetings and where they were. Uh, and again, you can go through this and, and take a look at these, but they were talking, Bob, uh, introduced, uh, the speaker for that particular meeting and he was demonstrating the Apple. Let me make this a little bit bigger so we can all read it. The speaker who talked about the Apple Macintosh computer. He did a splendid job of demonstrating the capabilities of the Macintosh, with work, which works very much like the Lisa. And some of you may remember the Lisa computer. It's a compact unit weighing less than 23 pounds. And it comes with 128K bytes of RAM and 64K bytes of ROM. A Sony three and a half inch disk drive, which holds 400K bytes and uses a disk of rigid plastic housing. It has a micro, uh, a microchrome nine inch monitor and non-interlaced and it's 512 by 342 pixel resolution. It has a detached 58 key keyboard. Comes with two programs, Mac Paint, a drawing program and, and Mac Write, a simple word processor. It's possible to select various type fonts in different type fonts, sizes. These can be varied at will throughout the document. A mating printer will print whatever is presented on the screen. Many other programs are in the preparation stage and will soon be released, re released in the future. The meeting broke at this point for a coffee break and reconvened in about 45 minutes. Can you... <coughs> Those of us who are working with computers now, this is hard to remember back in those days. There wasn't software, there weren't printers, there wasn't, and it was very difficult to work with and to see what you were working with. And Bill Wellman spoke of a new line printer that he saw at a recent show, which would do just about anything in the way of formatting. He had samples of the printouts. He didn't even have the printer. And he mentioned two new books on, on DBase 2. And the SIG chairman who were present gave reports on what's happening with them. So certainly a lot different back in those days uh, than we have today. I, I'm going to take a break right now and see if there's any comments. Uh, let's see, stop sharing my screen. Uh, any comments from people who remember about those days or people who don't? And, and uh, any questions about how we lived in those days? Uh, Bob, go ahead. Way back in the 70s, uh, on my Commodore VIC-20, I wrote a word processing program called Tiny Word. And it had all the features. It was able to detect the end of the 80 characters and automatically do a hyphen so you could go and continue. It was lots of fun. I wrote it in Commodore Basic, and then I used the compiler so that it was actually functionable. And uh, did quite a bit of work with it, but that was the old days. And yes, we had cassettes that on which we were able to uh, get our programs. Uh, no hard drive. It was fun. And you're right. There was no real security back then. Yeah. My first computer was a Commodore PET, but uh, my second one was a uh, uh, Radio Shack TRS-80. Yep. And I, I bought a magazine that had programs that you could type in and save them and then use them. And one was a word processor. But it, once I typed it all in and saved it to, to use the program, I had to start it. It took 20 minutes to load. I would create the document. If I wanted to save the document as I went along, you know how you save and then continue? I had to save it. It took another 20 minutes to save it out, another 20 minutes to reload the program so I could continue. And 
with the document and then continue writing the document. Uh, and so it, 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 was, it, it was hard to do, but I was never a touch typist. So for me to type anything and be able to correct it, it still was very nice to be able to do. Uh, and, uh, and my first printer was a, an Oki Data Microline 80. It was the first dot matrix printer for under $1,000. I paid $999. And it didn't even have a knob on it to advance it. You had to advance it using software. Uh, it was, uh, those days were, were, were a challenge at best. But let's continue and let's look at 1988 unless somebody else has any comments or questions about that. Yeah, I was going to say something about the, uh, the sure. back in the Atari, back in the days. My club started as Atari okay. back in 83. And uh, I'm the founder and started producing a newsletter on my Atari computer. But basically back in those days, we only had 40 column display on the uh, monitors. Until Atari came out with Atari Writer a few years later, it gave me 80, 80 columns. But I also had the Oki Dita printer for printing out, and it was it was fun. But I did our newsletter for about 14 years and gave it up. And, and that's why a lot of us joined user groups back in those days, because <clears throat> the only place to get any help. And, and there were a lot of other people. And that's one thing I liked about the the Osborne group. We all had Osborne's that all came with software. So we were all able, we all had the same software. So we were able to help each other with different software. Walter Wood, you had a question. Or yeah, I was in the, the TRS-80 club here in Orlando. And eventually I think we merged with CFCS, uh, but I had a TRS-80 and uh, the disk drive, which took the five and a quarter drives, which I think held 77K, cost $500. <laughs> and I had a payroll program that I got from uh, Radio Shack that needed two tape drives, regular cassette tapes. And last month's um, payroll was on one. It would read the one off the old tape. Then it would have to write any new information to the new tape. And eventually I ended up rewriting that to, to do t disk import. But uh, it, it was a fun time. <laughs> yes, yeah, so it certainly was. So uh, Ken, you had something. Yeah, to say. I had one here. It just it kind of along the same lines. Um, it was a... Uh, I did TRS-80 stuff and then color computers too. Um, but I, at the time, I was teaching, this, I was doing the assignment language programming and I was teaching the Z80, which is the TRS-80 processor in uh, junior college at the time, assembly language. Started out with about 25 people in the class, wind up with about 10. <laughs> um, and people would come in and say, I want to learn a little about my computer. And I would tell them the best way to do that is sleep on the books, because you'll learn a lot about your computer if you learned to be an assembly language programmer. But it was fun. Yeah, was yeah fun. There, were, there were professional computer people like yourself. And then there were those of us who were just hobbyists. We bought them because well, some of us used them in business. But we mainly bought them in the beginning was to learn how to use them. Just the fact that they were out there and it, it was a, a, a new toy to learn how to use. But there was no way to learn. There weren't books. There weren't magazines. And so user groups were a big benefit uh, to, all, to, to many of us to get together and to be able to ask questions like we're doing here. We were able to do in person, but there was no other place to go to get. There was no Internet. There was no other place to go. Dave Montgomery, unmute yourself and come on in. Hey, thanks, Huey. Yeah, I, I remember my... Uh... My first computer was a, uh, I was really forward thinking. So I bought an H, a Heath kit, H11, which were being sold as kits at the time. Um, the operating system was loaded from a taper, from a paper tape reader, which took about a half an hour to run through. Um, so about uh, 1976 or or uh, maybe even late as eight, I, I approached the computer club and uh, was interested in joining, but discovered that, uh, of course, at that time, everybody was running uh, eight bit machines. And my H11 was a way out of this world 16 bit machine. <laughs> so I didn't have much help at the computer club. So I put off joining for a couple of years and, uh, Finally, the rest of the world seemed to catch up with me, but uh, I was on to other things anyway. But I was in the computer club for almost, I don't know, 20 years. 
Yeah, and, I think um, you you wrote the the membership database at one time, didn't you? Uh, yeah, actually, I did. Yeah, it was uh, yeah, it was more of the mailing list for the newsletter at the time. Yeah. I was uh, my my role with the the bus line was uh, basically advertising, but I worked with Gordon Finney a lot. He did the newsletter on Ventura Publisher at the time. Um, so that's where I came from, and um, let's see, we're still at it here. Appreciate it. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm going to share my screen. We're going to go look at one of Gordon's uh, newsletters uh, next. I'll share the screen. And we're still here. So let's go. I'm going to close that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to open this one, 1988-01. I'm going to open it with uh, not a, a Adobe Acrobat, but a Adobe Acrobat Reader, which is what you would, would probably look at. You can see it's quite quite similar to what I was just showing you. I'll full, let's see, I'm not gonna full screen it because I have something at the top that you don't have in your screen. So I'm going to make, I am going to make it bigger. Uh, it's right here. Let's make it about 200%. Uh, I'd better full, make it wider. See if I can get it all in. And I don't know how to close this out. Oh yeah, I do right here. There we go. And I probably can close this right now. There we go. Okay, this is a bus line from from January 1988. This, so it's a comparable to this month is why I did it. Bud Stoniker was president at the time. I had just I had moved to Orlando uh, sometime in 1987 and joined CFCS uh, as soon as I I. I came. And of course, the next year, what happened was, you'll see farther down, uh, I ended up uh, uh, as vice president my first year as a member. Uh, and here's get, uh, Gordon Finley's uh, column on the editor's desk. You'll see, uh, let's see, was it here? It'll be farther down. But Stoniker was president, Terry Shockley, vice president, Charlie Burge, uh, who a lot of us knew. He, was, he passed away a few years ago. Uh, Joe Poli, uh, he and his wife were very active in the group. They were killed in a plane crash in uh, on Alaska, a uh, tourist uh, plane. Uh, John Neal, Bob Tate, Jim Smith, there might be some names that some of you may recall from back in those days that, who are here. Joe Poli talked about the December meeting. There were 60 people that attended the regular monthly meeting. Uh, and you'll see that I... Uh, the nomination for the 1988 included me and I became vice president uh, in this January meeting. Uh, let's see, what else did they talked about? Review tentative agenda. And they really didn't talk about lectures prepared by many of our members. Uh, Mike Peterson, I, I did a sometime in Stan Walner. This meeting, Bill Hart reviewed the tip the merits of software catalog program. If you remember, we had shareware libraries in those days. And so we talked a lot about that and, and talked about programs that were in our library. Uh, special interest groups. There was a CompuPro SIG. CompuPro was a type of computer. Bill Vermillion led that. Bill was a local disc jockey and very active in uh, computers uh, back in those days. Uh, there was a database user group, uh, DBase, I should say. Rich Sias uh, ran that, and uh, DBase came with uh, uh, the Osbournes, and that's how I learned how to use DBase. But then people were buying, and they it became uh, a program that you could use with PCs uh, later on, and uh, became one of the major database programs. Uh, Charlie Burge. Uh, uh, found time to prepare a brief and comprehensive talk on program design and development. And he talked a little bit about, uh, again, DBase 3 uh, plus, so different versions of DBase. And uh, let's see, there's, again, you can take a look at the, uh, uh, at the newsletter itself. And then let's see, uh, Dave mentioned the Heath. There was actually a Heath users group and uh, they met uh, once a month as well, and they were a SIG 
as part of uh, CFCS. There was the PS PC MS DOS SIG, which turned into the Windows SIG, and which is what we're, we've got now. It's still around. Uh, Mike, at one time, I think you took it over as the uh, I think it was still PC, and then there were a couple other people did, and then I ended up taking it back as a Windows SIG. Uh, uh, from somebody and I've been running it ever since uh, and I and I enjoyed doing it so I uh, what's interesting is the is the legacy of the command structure is still in the latest version of what Microsoft has put out as Windows 10 just bring up the command prompt and all the legacy commands or most of them are there yep absolutely uh, let's see they talked to Stan Waller commented on the TSR management program flush. Stan, I wonder if you even remember that. Uh, myself and Terry Ray filled us in on the latest enhancements to their respective bulletin boards. And I discussed a new share or utility called iConvert. And I think there's an article here about that. Uh, there was a Tandy TRS-80 SIG. And that was Rich Corbett's uh, group. Uh, I would later work, work with Rich Corbett, or maybe it was uh, about this time, I guess. I would think I might have brought him into CFCS. Um, and so, uh, th there were SIGs back in those days, but they were a lot different than uh, the ones we have today. Uh, nice newsletter that, uh, Gordon put together. He did a really good job back in those days and he was very, very thorough and made sure that we had lots of articles. Uh, now this was 1988. So this was going back to 1978. Uh, he's talking, there were 50 members that, that, uh, attended a meeting in 1978, uh, and then the Bite Shop of Coco conducted a demonstration of their speech lab board running in their MC computer, and then a door prize consisting of an 88 programming course donated by the Bite Shop. Wow. And Data Entry Engineering had a display showing their SWTP 6800 computer operating as a multiple terminal time sharing system. Uh, way, way beyond me. And then Ron Willoughby brought in his pet computer and demonstrated it. And that was in 1978. And this is just a, um, a memory column within this 1988 uh, newsletter. Those days, the president was urging members to bring in their projects for the group to admire during the informal part of the program, during which those with similar systems could have a chance to exchange thoughts and ideas. We don't do that anymore. Uh, uh, CFCS still does in our tech SIG. And we all we all bring to the table and literally brought to the table in Denny's for, for several years. And now we do it here on Zoom. But that's what the tech SIG is on the fourth Tuesday of every month. And Stan leads that. And we're still doing it. We do it every month. And all of you are invited to join that uh, if, at any month and just contact me and I'll, I'll get you the information on how to join. Uh, this, and again, it's, you don't have to be a member of the group to, to attend and you don't, there's no payment for it. The SIGs of course are devoted to the type of activity we have more or less. Uh, Jim Coppins uh, was an officer at one time at CFCS and there's his business card. Members make news. Uh, here's the membership data that we, we had 200 members in 86 and uh, 229 in 87. Uh, so we were in the under 300 range back in those days. Here's a calendar of events for the month. And, uh, and these were mailed and that was a mailing label. So that's, uh, the 1988, uh, let me go ahead and stop share. See if there are any comments or. Uh, Anybody yeah. need MS-DOS? <laughs> no. Yeah. Got it right good. here. He's showing a five and a, a five and a half inch, uh, five and a half inch uh, disc uh, flop. Those were truly floppy discs. Show how f floppy it is. It, it actually. Are you talking bends. about me or the disc? Uh, the yeah. disc. Both. <laughs> I, I'm going to say the same thing. My club had a shareware library, and we had them on five inch floppies. And then when we went to the uh, 16 bit Atari, it went down to the three inch uh, disc. But uh, we had to type in the programs and then compile them to run them out of a couple of Atari magazines that were available. As far as my newsletter uh, uh, that I created, 
I took all the old copies uh, before we can PDF them, and I PDF them. And right now we have them all them online back to 1983 in PDF format. And as far as the MS DIS uh, DOS is concerned, Atari had an emulator that we used to play with the MS DOS. And there was a user group at, well, it wasn't called a SIG at the time, but basically that's what it was back up in the up in Milwaukee that I used to go to. We used to play around with MS DOS. And uh, I remember back in the days, we also, when PCs came about, we used to build a PC during the meetings, which was fun also. Yeah, I have somewhere here uh, an eight inch floppy disk that were used uh, on IBM machines long before PCs. So they yeah. were even bigger and they held less <laughs> information uh, yeah, well, than the five we and a quarters. Doing, when we were doing the MS, uh, the uh, Microsoft with the emulator up in Milwaukee, we had the big uh, eight inch or eight inch or 10 inch drives that we were using. And we had a couple of them uh, built into an emulator for Atari for the MS-DOS SIGs. But uh, yeah, it was all fun. Right now I have the our uh, shareware collection somewhere in my basement of the floppies of the eight, five inch and the uh, three inch floppies, well over a couple of hundred discs down there. Someday I'll put them out and have them melted down or whatever or something, recycle <laughs> them. <laughs> you, remember, you remember the capacity of this? Single sided, single density? Eight. 180, and then if you uh, if you clipped it, then you had a, you turned your floppy to a flippy, and it was 360. There you uh, go. By a double sided, yep. double density drive. Yep, that's yeah. what it was. Right, that's right. Yeah, you put, punch a hole in it, and you use both sides of it. But that yeah, that was the days. It was all fun back in the days. I still anybody, have one of those punches in my desk drawer. I got I one still, I still, if I still anybody have one knows of, where, if any, excuse me, if anybody knows where I can get a five and a quarter inch portable uh, disc drive. I would appreciate knowing about it. Yeah, I have a three and a, a three and a quarter inch, uh, three and a half inch I, floppy a USB, over. but I don't have a five and a quarter, and I wish I did. Oh, I'll, I'll look. I think I do have one or two. So I, got, I think I have one or two. I library, and I got hundreds of each of the five inch and the three inch. They're all down in a file in a file cabinet along with my Atari eight hundred in a nice old velvet case, which I still got from nineteen eighty three. Yeah, yeah, I just. I haven't got any uh, drives, but I have a copy of the five and a quarters for Windows 286 and Windows 386. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I, was, yeah. I do I do have several. Uh, I have the, the large floppies and I have the drives. So uh, contact me if you like, and I'll see if I can dig them out for you. That'd be swell. Anybody oh, yeah. remember Zip Disk? Oh, I yeah. do. I've, I've got Zip Disk. Yeah, I've got... <laughs> Yeah, the 250 and the 100. Yep, got a few of those floating around. Yep. I got something older. Okay. Punch card. <laughs> <laughs> I used to do pay I used to do payroll for IBM out in San Jose, California and punch cards. What I, I that was coming. That, that was invigorating. <laughs> yeah, Dave showing his punch cards. Yeah, Dave, 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 Dave showing one. There. Uh, part part of my job description when I, I worked at ABC Liquors in their main office uh, for a, for a while they had me in the computer department and uh, one of my jobs was to take a uh, uh, they had a machine dedicated I would take the cards and I'd run them through this machine and it would put the information on a floppy disk uh, and that was and I'd spend all day long just putting cards through and writing it to a floppy disk so they could use them in the newer machines. They use uh, floppies. Punch cards were, were the very reason that I changed my major in college from data processing to business. <laughs> Understandable. I, I okay, no let's punch let's, cards in the Air Force. I got to where I could hold up and read them. <laughs> let's go ahead and share my screen again and uh, do this last uh, bus line here. And I didn't realize when. <coughs> And people say, yeah, of course you didn't. Uh, but you'll notice there's one article and a second article on the front page of it by me. So I didn't notice that when I scanned it until after I scanned it. But uh, this is from January 1990, two years later than the one I just showed you. And things had, had improved. Uh, I don't know whether improved, but it had progressed quite a bit. And the meeting for this particular one was, uh, uh, let's see, for the, it was a shareware author that was going to, was a member of the Association of Shareware Professionals. 
and author of Lotto Profit. He would speak on the Lotto program. It was a program that could you could keep track of, of your lotto numbers and would give you, you know, spew out based on previous lottos, uh, some possibilities uh, of, of choices. And also it would also uh, uh, give you some random numbers to choose if you wanted to. And that was, and then I uh, also a, uh, an article about word perfect 5.1, which was used by a lot of people back in those days. Uh, let's see. And from the desk of the president, uh, this was the meeting we were uh, changing. I believe we started. No, it was later on that we moved uh, places to uh, the uh, high school. And I don't remember the name of the high school that we met at. But here are the officers. You can see the membership numbers back then was 412. Uh, Mike, I was looking for the uh, issue of bus line, and I don't believe I have it, of uh, uh, the time period where Bill Gates came and spoke to CFCS. And I don't even remember the exact date. Whenever it was, Microsoft was afraid they wouldn't fill the auditorium. And so they offered anyone who joined CFCS that night that they would uh, uh, pay half of their membership dues. And we not only filled the hall, the fire Marshall came, closed down the hotel. It was at the Sheridan Hotel right off of I-4. And, and the uh, backup, uh, the car backup was up onto I-4 to get off and go to the hotel. And they weren't allowing anyone else in. And they it was, they uh, shut down the, the, uh, the going home traffic on I-4. Yeah. They had to bring in a police escort and escort him along the side of the road to get him to the hotel. Yeah. Uh, and and our membership went from at that time around of uh, three or four hundred to over around thirteen hundred in one night, and I can remember Ted uh, Goodwin and uh, uh, Jim Daly. I think were at the desk signing people up. There might have been some other people. Uh, they all was, thought they had to join in order to go in yeah, for the conference, and was, some of them were upset because they couldn't go in because we. I was there and couldn't get in. Yeah, uh, and and I part of my duty was to. Uh, escort him up to the dais and and I can one of the things I remember him speaking about at that at that meeting was he he envisioned everyone having uh, a a PC computer on their desk everyone would have their own computer and Rad that was radical too yep yeah, and, and his and you would have memory in it as large as what their hard drives were in that day. And I think that in those days, I think it was 40 megabytes was a huge hard drive. And so he was saying, yeah, you'll have at least 40 megabytes of RAM on your computer. So he was, he really did think in advance uh, ahead of his time. And it was, it was very interesting talking to him the, and meeting him on top of it. And Mike the, and I won him. Yeah. At an That's APC UG, say. and I'm going to show you uh, a, a picture of that uh, very oh, briefly here in a few minutes. Uh, uh, but uh, Mike and I won him. We were both at the APC UG convention at Comdex. And I, again, don't remember the year. It was probably around 93 or 94. Uh, and uh, uh, they were giving away as a drawing at a Microsoft APC UG event where he, he was there mingling with us all uh, to, to have him come to your user group to speak. And the Boston Computer Society won the drawing and he had just spoken there. So they said, well, we're not going to uh, use that. We'll draw another name. And it was the Central Florida Computer Society. And Mike went up and accepted the, uh, uh, the offer that night. So uh, that's how we got him to come and speak to our group. And uh, it significantly changed our operation. We went, as you can see, 412 members in, in this particular bus line. And, and we would probably get around 200 or so at a meeting. So, you know, we had, a, we had to hunt around for high school auditoriums. We, we went to Rollins College and went to their auditorium. But jumping up to 1,500 members cost us you know, a, a gigantic uh, paradigm shift in, in how you support. Now that dropped back down again, but, but for a long time we were in that eight to 900 uh, member yeah. range just from that event. 
and you can see the special interest groups back in, in now, and this was in uh, uh, 1990. And by the way, if you look at the, uh, let me go, let me look at the next page. Notice it says January 1989. Copy and pasting back in those days didn't work. We all had problems with it as well. This was the 1990 January uh, edition, but all of the pages except the cover page and I think the back page said 1989. So we had the CompuPro SIG was still around, the database SIG, uh, the desktop publishing SIG, Fox based SIG, the instructional SIG, the investment SIG, the PCMS DOS SIG, and the Tandy SIGs were all SIGs back in those days. Uh, and because of the, the event and the size, we actually wound up uh, renting a storefront and and conducting our SIG meetings and our seminars in the storefront for several years. Yeah, yeah that was much later than this this edition of the bus right. line. But you can see uh, the library news. Uh, they did a survey. Let's see what else is here. We've got a few more minutes here. And then I'll uh, look at those pictures and then we can have some discussion on anything. Uh, um, let's see. I'm just kind of going through this quickly. These hey, are some of the, yes. Yeah, I was at that. I was at the Comdex with y'all on that with uh, with Bill Gates, and when he was here, I had some. Uh, I did some photographs that never got published into Busline that I still hang on to. And if uh, you ever need them, I've got every Busline back to about 1985. Oh, I've I've got a lot of them, but I don't have. I would like to find a copy of of the one from. Uh, uh, let's see. I'm going to stop the share because who was that? Dave, it was talking. Yeah. Uh, I would like to find the one where it talks about. Bill, there's probably one before he came, and then one after he came, and, and to show the membership numbers or find one that's got the membership numbers and so on. I dig it uh, up for you. All right, I appreciate it. Uh, and if you wish, if you don't have the ability to scan them uh, easily. If you'll just put them in an envelope, I'll scan them and send them back to you. I'll now, scan them. No problem. Okay. Uh, but I do want to show those pictures. Now, let me, let's see, share the screen. It's in the video, but I, let's see, it's probably the best way to find it. I think I stopped that video. Uh, let's see, I'll close this. And let's see, I don't need this, I don't think. I hope. And then, um, oh, wouldn't you know what? I do need this. Sorry about this, folks. But uh, let's see, YouTube. This keyboard doesn't want to start sometimes. And let's see, I'm trying to think where I put that video. It's in here. So if I go to your channel, these are all in my channel and a new way to scan. I've already had 400 views, by the way. I do want to show something because I'm proud of this. I did one three weeks ago, a video. I've already had 769 views. This one I've had 400, but let me click this. And I think the entire document. Okay. Right. Right, he's late here. 80s, early 90s. And I'm going to stop and what I'm going to video. do and make this full screen. Well, full Oops. screen. And I think I got us off of where we wanted to be. See if I can find it again. Yeah, right Oops. here. There's uh, Jim Daly, who was my business partner, Mike. Uh, this is a fellow out of out of uh, North Florida. And this fellow was a, and I can't remember his name off the top of my head. He was in the Sarasota group. Uh, Marshall, you probably can recognize him. I think he was president of your group or he was very active in your group. Uh, and there's uh, Jim Daly, Mike and myself back in at this Comdex meeting. And this was one of the, one of the breakfasts or lunches or dinners that we had that they would, uh, one of the companies would sponsor and we'd all have uh, our meal and then they would speak. And a lot of times they'd give us a whole copy of, of Microsoft Office or they'd give us a copy of, of, uh, of DBase or 
uh, or they do drawings and somebody would win a, a computer with a Intel motherboard because Intel was giving it away and so on. So I thought you'd get a kick out of those pictures. And by the way, this, what this uh, scanner is that I have, I put these four things underneath it. I took a picture of them and then it, it made four separate JPEGs from the scanner. It's a really neat scanner. And you might want to take a look on my website if you did not see that program to, you, uh, to see how to use that uh, particular scanner. That was Bart Koslow. Bart Koslow, yes. And he was instrumental in, 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 along with Mike and several others that put together uh, the Florida Association of Computer User Groups that first met at, at a Golden Corral in Sarasota many years ago. And Mike got elected president that year of FACUG and he was first president of the Florida Association, which I believe is in limbo. I don't believe they have uh, officers anymore. I believe it's still there, but I think uh, everybody's pretty much gone. Although they're still, if groups haven't stopped sending them money, they're still accepting dues. <laughs> but anyway, any questions? Uh, uh, don't believe our speaker has shown up, uh, Stan. Uh, I sure hope, I think he said three o'clock. So I'm hanging in there till three. Uh, I've not yet heard from him, no. Uh, he did register and he uh, does have the link to the meeting. Uh, Bob uh, G. Uh, Huey, Let's Compute was the name of the magazine that I got on a regular basis. And if you go on the Internet and do a search, they have in the archives still copies of all of their magazines. And that was one of those magazines that was loaded with DOS programs that you could type in and use. And, and there was also a Byte magazine, which was Correct. a little bit more advanced. And I, I saw recently uh, Esther Schindler, who was a, a very active in, in APCUG and, and her user groups and so on. She is a professional writer, mostly uh, uh, a lot of it's technology stuff. And I, I follow her. We're, we're friends on Facebook. And she shared a, a link to the Byte magazine. All of their magazines are online. Uh, and, uh, and I came across somewheres, uh, I saw an ad for Godfather's, Godfather Computers, which was, in, which was an Orlando company, and they advertised heavily in Computer Shopper. And that was a huge, thick magazine. Oh, yeah. Of, uh, it was bigger than 9 by 11. It was a huge magazine, and, and that thick, and uh, mostly ads and some articles of all kinds of computer stuff that was a lot of fun browsing every month. Uh, I can remember in... my, my original computer since people were talking about it. I was an Apple II guy and uh, I can, you know, and it used to be an audio tape before, before it was floppy disk, but I can remember I was stationed in Key West with the Navy and I heard that an Apple store had opened in Miami, one of the first Apple stores in the United States. And I, I drove up for the day just to go to the store to buy something that was called Lotus 123, which I'd never heard of before, and try to figure out what in the world would anybody do with a spreadsheet? I mean, you know, numbers and, and, and putting them in squares, that makes no sense to me at all. So how we've changed. Yes. Uh, and, and my first computer, as I said, was a Commodore PET and how I happened to buy it. I was in an Olson electronics store in Tampa and there was a nine-year-old kid playing with his, with one on a shelf and he was typing in stuff and something was happening on the screen. I said, he can, I can. So I bought one, but I was, I was torn between a uh, right across the street was an Apple store or an Apple II store, a store that sold Apple IIs. And I went back and forth and I looked at them, but I wanted something that would be, uh, Apple at that time was not as business minded. Uh, right. And I decided, well, I'd probably use it in business or for business eventually. And so I bought the Commodore PET instead of the Apple. And that's only the reason why I didn't have an Apple. And we had an work. Apple II users group here in Orlando also yeah. that yeah. I joined and, in 87. And when I was in the Tampa Bay Osborne group, uh, one of the fellows that was uh, had an Osborne bought a Lisa 
and he brought it in and we were in a different room with all those that were interested in seeing that. And so we got to see the Apple uh, Lisa, which was a forerunner of the Macintosh. So, and yeah, all was, of us as technology developed, you know, were exposed to the concept of bulletin board systems. We could probably have a whole session just on BBSs. But, oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. You ran one, I ran one. Stan was involved with, with it. Charlie Birch was involved with the uh, CFCS BBS. And I'm sure JJ, you, were you, was JJ still on? JJ's were still you? here. JJ Johnson, yeah. I'm still here. Yeah, yep. I ran a yep. BBS from 19, or excuse me, 1985 to 1991 uh, on the Atari, of course. I uh, started out with floppy drives and I went to uh, the, uh, hard drives, or excuse me, uh, yeah, hard drives. And uh, we had three of them in the, in the area up here in Waukegan, Illinois, and we called ourselves Tri-City Systems. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, matter of fact, I was just talking to one of our members the other day. Yeah, he had moved from here down to Virginia, and he used to log into my BBS at about 3 o'clock in the morning thinking I was asleep, <laughs> and I would <laughs> chat with him. But yeah. There are several people on here that were members of my BBS, and I think I, uh, I switched from BBS to... Uh, uh, to the internet, I think it was around 1995. So this was pre-95. I see Norm Griffin, uh, um, uh, Stan, of course, I think was on. I don't remember. I came Dave. down to your apartment to see what you were doing. Yeah. And you uh, had it all set up there. So, so back in those days, it was a lot of fun running those BBSs. I had four phone lines coming into a rented apartment that I had. And, uh, and Eventually, when I got into the computer business, opened up a store, I moved it there, and my business partner had a bulletin board, and they were both in the same, in the same room together. Uh, and then our technician w was a real techie, and he got a, a satellite dish and was doing FIDO feeds, FIDO network feeds from the satellites. So we, we, we not only had... Uh, servers with CD-ROM drives with shareware on them, but we were getting downloads every day of hundreds of shareware programs uh, from the satellite. So it was, uh, it was a lot of fun in those days. And, and of course, you couldn't download much. It took so long and so on. I think I did a, a session on timing and, and how long it took, but it was, uh, it was a lot of fun in those days. Yeah, I know when I started 300 baht, and I was only on for the weekend, and shortly thereafter, I got a second line in the house 24-7. But yeah, 300 baht took you a while. And it was all about, you know, trading shareware software. Yeah, 300, 300 baht, you could see each letter as somebody was <laughs> if somebody was typing. If you, if you watch somebody who was a slow typer like me, that's how fast the letters would. So you didn't get words on the screen or paragraphs or pages. You got one letter at a time coming up on the screen. It was, it was, uh, it was painstaking. Bill and, then, and then the major update with us robotics going to 2,400 baud. Yeah. Yeah. We Somebody just thought that was really fast. Somebody just started to say something about Bill Vermillion. Yeah. Go Bill ahead. Vermillion ran the first, one of the first, uh, what uh, communications thing, they weren't called BBS back then, but before I even had a computer, I got a terminal. Right. Took the monitor with the keyboard. But uh, I logged into that thing probably a year or two before I even bought a computer. We thought it was great just to type messages back and forth. And that's all he did. Uh, he was uh, just getting started himself, but he, he, uh, he was a pioneer in the Central Florida for having a, uh, a, a network that you can... Uh, we were able to take the uh, Apple BBS, which ran a Linux emulator uh, that was written in machine language and uh, was added in as, a, as an app in Apple Basic. And uh, somebody had written an Apple VBS system using that, and we could tie into Bill Vermillion's system, and that linked the Apple bulletin boards uh, from around the country so they could exchange message structures or messages. This has been the Central Florida Computer Society's Windows Special Interest Group for Sunday, January 10th, 2021. I want to thank everyone for joining.